Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Prasad Padmanabhan, uh, and I assure you I'm wearing trousers. Um, welcome to this joint webcast between AICB and the Asia School of Business on helicopter money, stimulus packages in a time of crisis. We are indeed excited to commence our first webcast collaboration with ASB today under the AICB's Empowering Bankers webinar series, which is part of, uh, of AICB's efforts to bring greater online sharing and knowledge to our members during these unprecedented times. Uh, before we do start, a few housekeeping details. The microphones of all participants are automatically muted to minimize disruption to the session. This is also an interactive session, so if you have any questions, please submit your questions online by clicking the Q&A tab. Please introduce yourselves by stating your name and the organization that you represent. We will do our best to try and answer as many as we can, and please understand that uh, we may not get to all of them uh, it, it, during the session. You also have a chat function to provide comments and feedback during the session. Kindly know that the session is recorded and the speaker's presentation will be emailed to you and recording will be available on the AICB member portal. If you wish to leave the webinar session, please select leave meeting on the bottom right of your screen, do so. You can still rejoin the webinar session if it's still in progress. Uh, and you know, please bear with us, there will be glitches as we all get used to this, this new reality basically. Um, our speaker today is Professor Genberg. Uh, he's the Professor of Finance, Associate Program Director at C of Central Banking at the Asia School of Business. As some may be aware, Hans previously worked for the Southeast Asian Central Bank Research and Training Center as an advisor on macroeconomics and monetary policy management. Prior to that, he was the Assistant Director at the Independent Evaluation Office of the International Monetary Fund. And he has extensive academic experience having been Professor of International Economics at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva. As the impact of the coronavirus pandemic is felt across the world, governments and banks have had to consider the extreme measures to try and address its devastating impact on the global economy and communities, especially as consumer spending takes a big hit. This is where drastic measures like helicopter money as a stimulus package is fast gaining traction and has been seriously considered and even implemented in some countries. So without further ado, uh, can I uh, turn you over to Professor Hans Genberg? Thank you, Prasad. Thank you for that very nice and, uh, uh, introduction. And thank you to the AICB for hosting this webinar. It's a real pleasure to speaking to you about helicopter money and more generally about stimulus packages in this time of, of economic crises. Uh, and I want to talk about how they should be designed and how you pay for them. And also a little bit about how, what the consequences are of uh, these stimulus packages and, and economic lockdown. So let me uh, delve right into the subject and uh, give a little bit of a history of this mysterious term helicopter money. What, where did it come from and, and what does it really refer to? Well, it started by this fellow Milton Friedman, who actually was a professor of mine uh, a number of years ago, I won't tell you how many years ago, but uh, he, uh, he thought of helicopter money as a thought experiment so, to explain how monetary policy works. He said, we're supposed to be drop money on, from helicopters on the society and people pick it up and spend it. How will that affect employment and prices over time? That's what he, he, how he used the term. But then others have used it subsequently more sort of in a, in a perhaps more direct way. Uh, ben Bernanke, also a very famous economist, and he became called uh, uh, Helicopter Ben. Um, here he is, and here he is in, in his uh, helicopter. Uh, he asked, he was the head of the Federal Reserve in the US, and he asked, how can we stimulate the economy on monetary, with monetary policy when the interest rates are almost zero, so we can't lower them to uh, any further. So he said, suggested maybe we need to, to uh, resort to some form of helicopter money. And this term has been used now uh, more recently to ask how can we transfer money to unemployed workers and firms which are in, in, uh, in, in, uh, going bankrupt as a result of the coronavirus pandemic and the economic consequences thereof. So this, this is helicopter money, but uh, as, as somebody once said, a rose by any other name is still a rose. Um, helicopter money, uh, 
the way it was originally thought of was the central bank here in this picture, uh, giving cash to the population. But uh, more recently, one can think of it as cash transfers from the government, from the treasury, the finance ministry, to individuals. But how do they get the cash? If the central bank is the one who prints the money, the, the treasury gets the cash from the treasury by giving them something like T-bills or some similar instrument. Now, if you consolidate the central bank and the um, treasury into one public sector, then, of course, what you get is essentially the, the, the original picture. The public sector transferred cash cash to the, the uh, population, and then there's some in, internal uh, balance sheet arrangement between the Treasury and, and, the, and the central bank. Now, so this is one way of stimulating uh, the economy in, in times of crisis. There, but there are many other types of stimulus packages that, that have been proposed and, and actually implemented, as we will see. Here is a, a list, a partial list, uh, of instruments, who is in charge, and who, who will receive the, um, the the fruit of these instruments. So on top, you have the cash transfers or helicopter money. It can be done, as we just saw, by the Treasury or the central bank, and it could go to individuals or firms. There could be tax policies issue, uh, done by the Treasury. Uh, firms can get tax holidays, individual income taxes can be reduced, and there could be various other changes in taxes. There could be concessional loans. Uh, commercial banks can be directed by the Treasury or the central bank to lend on, on concessional terms to firms that are in trouble. Uh, and the treasury itself can do uh, can uh, lend also directly to firms uh, in, in this sort of way. And finally, there's a general interest rate policy. Uh, the central bank can lower the policy interest rates in order to stimulate spending and investment. And that, that uh, affects everyone in principle. The whole economy is not either firms or individuals, it's, it's everybody. So these are the types of, of uh, support measures we could have. And then the question is, what, how do we determine which instrument to use and who should be the recipient? And to answer that question, we have to ask, what problem are we trying to address? Are we trying to address a supply shock, which is a decrease in production because various, of various degrees of lockdown in the economy, mandated shutdowns on firms, uh, forbidding for workers to uh, come go to work because they have to stay home in their, in their apartments and houses. Uh, there could also be a supply shock uh, due to global production chains, whereby assembly and wine factory is impossible because it needs the inputs from another factory and that fa other factory has been shut down. So the assembly firm can't can't work. So that is a possible uh, problem that we need to address. Another possible problem is a demand shock, a decrease in demand in the economy because uh, of loss of employment, loss of income. There could also be a decrease in investment de demand because of uncertainty. Firms do not want to undertake investment projects because of the uncertain uh, nature of the post-pandemic world. So they, they hold back on, on demand. So what is it? Are we do we have a supply shock or a demand shock or both? Well, in order to think about that, let's, let's think about two recessions in the US. I call them a slow motion versus a fast forward recession. On the left-hand side, you, you see the path of uh, un, insur un insurance claims, unemployment insurance claims in the United States uh, during the great uh, financial crisis in the 2008, 9, and 10. And you see, it took about a year and a half for, for uh, uh, unemployment claims to reach their peak. If you look at the right-hand side, you see what's going on now. 
And what took two and a half years, or one and a half years, sorry, in, in uh, 2008 and 9 has happened in two weeks this time. And th this is just the first two weeks. And, and of course, uh, since then, the uh, unemployment insurance claims have gone way, way, way up again. So this is not a typical slow motion recession due to a fall in demand. It's really what might be sort of likened to a medically induced coma for the economy. Firms have been forced to stop producing. Workers cannot go to work. No matter how much demand there is for uh, restaurant meals, we can't get them because we can't get to the restaurants, For ex to, to, to take just one example. So what we need to deal with is not the demand problem, it's a supply problem initially. So let me, let me pause here and uh, see if there are any questions because next, uh, next uh, I want to talk a little bit about how deep the recession uh, might, might be in various countries and in Malaysia in particular. And uh, in order to uh, talk about that question, I'm going to ask you to fill out a poll that I believe will be circulated or uh, posted to you. If you could fill that out, then we'll get the result back in almost real time and we can talk about those uh, as, as we, um, uh, when we return to the session. Now, uh, perhaps uh, there are questions uh, that have been uh, typed in on the chat. Prasad, okay. do you have any? Yes, Prof. So this is a, um, the first question comes, and you might want to keep this in your pocket while you go through your slides, but um, the question that someone's asked is that there is no free lunch. Who ultimately pays for helicopter money? And to go on from that, is this modern monetary theory that's gone from fringe to mainstream, and therefore do deficits really matter? Right. Um, I mean, you can keep that in your pocket if you like. That, 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 those, are, those are really excellent questions. I, I will get to uh, them uh, late, a little bit later on uh, when I ask the, exactly the same question. How do we pay for all these stimulus packages <laughs> and helicopter money in particular? And I will also touch on the modern monetary theory in that context. So uh, bear with me a little bit. I will, I will certainly get there. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other question to bear in mind as well is that uh, someone's asked if the COVID crisis is both a demand and supply shock, what is the closest example in history to this phenomenon? Because it, as we all know, Helicopter Ben is, a, uh, is, is basically a student of the Great Depression, which right. informs his view of the world. And we've been looking at the GFC, uh, Great Recession in, in uh, 2008, 2009. And perhaps we might have to start looking back to you know, 1929 till 1933, where I, I guess, you know, we never really saw growth until we had a world war. Um, but uh, also something to bear in mind. Right, that, those, that's a very, very uh, apropos uh, question as well. And here I think, if you think of the Great Depression, uh, at least uh, Milton Friedman uh, claimed that was due to, um, uh, essentially a financial crisis which led uh, to a lot of bank failures and led to uh, therefore unemployment, firms couldn't get financing, right. unemployment, a uh, fall in demand and the usual multiplier effect with a greater and greater um, shortfall in demand which led to a fall in GDP and so on and so forth. And it only, we, as you mentioned, we only came out of that once uh, that we had a huge increase in demand, unfortunately, that was in the form of a war, yeah. but um, uh, that's how we came out of it. In the great uh, financial uh, recession in 2008, 9, and 10, similarly, there was a, a problem in the financial sector, which, uh, which led to a fall in, in, um, in demand. In, in the United States and New York first, but that spread, that fall in demand spread throughout the, the rest of the world, uh, in particular here in Southeast Asia and, and uh, Asia more generally, uh, through a reduction in, in import demand from the Europe and, and North America. 
So these were demand resurgence that took a, some time to build up. I cannot think of a, well, no, a supply recession. Think of the oil price increases back in the, um, they were so long ago that uh, I keep forgetting exactly when they were. They were late, uh, late 70s, early 80s, where you have massive increases in the, in the price of oil which led to contraction, contraction in, in supply in some sense. And, uh, and that uh, was a recession uh, which one can probably describe as a, the initial cause was a supply shock. And that led to then uh, demand problems and so on and so forth. So that uh, there are some answers or attempts to answer those um, kinds of questions. Prof, there's also, you know, um, there is a question on, you know, just simply printing money, um, increases money supply. Um, you know, what then happens to inflation and inflation expectations at this point? I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't seem to be anywhere. Um, I, I believe you'll be uh, you'll be answering that a little later through your slides as well. That's and right. We do have, you know, I think a, a personal question by by a millennial who is basically you know, been hit by the uh, GFC and going through another one, are we looking at retirement savings um, being, you know, uh, hit by all of this uh, quite badly, um, you know, which I presume it will be the case, um, bearing in mind places like Japan have been, have had loose stimulus for over 25 years and it seems to have taken them nowhere. Uh, I think uh, this, this is a big concern. Uh, of course, uh, retirement savings, uh, I, I'm, I'm closer to that than most of you. Uh, but, uh, and there you have to, I think one has to think uh, sort of long term. One shouldn't panic. Stock markets have tumbled. They shouldn't say, okay, my re retirement saving has gone down by whatever, 20%. I need to take it out to make sure I don't lose anything more. Uh, you know, I, I think we should at least hope for uh, some recovery in two, three, four years, in which case these, uh, these asset markets, stock markets and other, other asset prices will, will regain some of their losses, uh, hopefully all, in which case we're, we're okay. So I right. think one should r remain calm uh, in these times and think of, of long term uh, the long term rather than, uh, you know, what, what is happening to my savings right now. Shall we, shall we continue All right, with the presentation? Let's, uh, let's move on and we, uh, can everybody see the poll results? In any case, uh, so the question was, what's your prediction for economic growth in Malaysia to 220? In other words, uh, the growth from 19 to 20. And we had various uh, ranges Minus four to uh, minus six is uh, r roughly 30% uh, of you thought that. Minus two to minus four, about 50%. Zero to minus two is 16, 17. And uh, zero to plus two is, is uh, roughly 10. So most people, there's sort of a uh, majority on minus two to four, but there's a a skewed distribution towards even worse outcome. Right. The the prediction for growth in 2021 relative to 20, uh, there was minus. Uh, hang on. Uh, the the me, uh, majority 35 percent is between zero and two. And uh, then there are a few few people who say two percent say greater than six. And uh, there are uh, people, uh, about 40, 50% think it's going to be negative, either up to zero to two or uh, minus two to, to four. So this, these are very interesting for, for two reasons. One is that uh, in terms of the um, projections for 220, this group of, of, uh, of uh, people are more pessimistic than the Bank Negara forecast. Bank Negara forecast in their annual report, which was published uh, a couple of weeks ago, said uh, plus 0 0.5 to minus two. Most of you think it's going to be worse than that. 
uh, that, uh, now, hopefully, Bank Negara is right, uh, but uh, at least this is an interesting indication of the mood in the financial industry as represented by the AICB. In terms of recovery, uh, th that is even more stark, at least in comparison with the IMF. The IMF thought it's going to be a 9% growth. Most of you, a majority, over 50% is, think it's going to be negative in, two, in 2021. Prof, were you meaning to move your slides? We're still stuck at the questions page. Uh, well, uh, do you see the poll results? Uh, not yet. Ah, sorry. I've been talking about the poll results. I'm right. uh, terribly sorry because I have it on my screen. Do we have it on your screen now? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. I, I thought it showed up in mine. I thought it showed up with everybody. So here is uh, so here's what I've been talking about. The majority is um, is 47 percent to minus two to minus four, and uh, quite a significant number worse than that in terms of 2021. Uh, 2020. In terms of 2021, we see um, uh, the the. Majority is sort of um, at, at zero to two plus, but a lot of people think it's going to be worse. Right. Okay. So sorry about uh, uh, Hans. Uh, yeah. I think participants say they can't see the screen of the poll result. Ah. Uh, I am afraid I am incapable of. <laughs> technical aspect of that to to uh, to show the results. Uh, I, okay, okay, I, Ken already. It's, it's, it's on the screen. I think I'm just looking at the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, okay, Professor cool. Hans. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, I'm sure we can, uh, you can, you can share those results with the participants uh, after in some form or other. Anyway, I think they're very interesting. I think, I think, I think the, the, the crux of it is that most people are Far more um, pessimistic than the, uh, the central bank and the world, and the IMF uh, uh, results as well, basically. Right. Exactly. Now, can we remove the poll poll results? Yes, we can. Let me let me. Um, uh, so we have talked about uh, the um, poll results. Here is the. Uh, um, uh, what I uh, what we had for the, for the IMF, and uh, with a very optimistic result for the for Malaysia, which you participants didn't really believe. Let me say something about recoveries. Economists are fond of using letters to describe recoveries: V shaped, U shaped, W shaped, L shaped. What does all that mean? The V shaped is one where you have a recession and a very quick recovery right thereafter and within uh, within a year or so that's a little bit what the imf suggests the u shape is a more drawn out it's a little bit like the great financial crisis we had a crisis and it took uh, several years before we got back to to some semblance of normalcy a, a w shape is is an interesting one in the, in the current context what that means is that there's a re uh, recession start of a recovery, uh, fall back into uh, a slowdown, and then uh, before the economy takes up, uh, picks up again. This could come, uh, come about, hopefully not, but it could, if we um, have a situation where after the lockdown, the economy starts picking up, but number of cases of uh, infected uh, individuals also increase. So the authorities say, well, we need to have some partial lockdown again. Then the economy slows again, and then afterwards takes takes off. Uh, the L-shaped one is a, uh, is a disturbing one in the sense that then we, we have a recession and we start growing, but we'll never catch up to where we would have been. That's a little bit of what happened in the United States after the great financial rec uh, recession of 2009-10. They've never really caught up to where uh, they would have been without that recession. So what, which one of these we get depends on how we manage the downturn. If we, if we manage uh, not to uh, have too many, uh, many um, 
firms go bankrupt or uh, distressed individuals staying unemployed for too long so they lose all their skills, then maybe we'll get something uh, V-shaped or a small U. Uh, and also it depends, of course, on the, how the pandemic evolves, as I just suggested. All right. So what should policies focus on? Remember, we, uh, we should think of this uh, session as a, as a comatose economy where it's been induced. We cannot produce because we're not allowed to uh, keep factories open, firms, uh, employees are not allowed to go to work. So what should we do? We need to be targeted. First of all, of course, on the health sector because we need to make sure that the health sector has enough resources to do, do, do its work. And then we need to support unemployed workers to relieve the immediate hardships, to allow them to pay rent, to, to buy essential foods, to, to pay their phone bills and electricity bills and so on and so forth. And, and this will help once they are, once the economy starts up because they will, these individuals will not have fallen into deep debt so they can, continue spending once they start having an income. We should also support viable small and medium term enterprises. In, in Malaysia, these enterprises are a big, big portion of the economy. We need to get them uh, to, to make sure that they continue working properly uh, or continue in business until the economy picks up. And uh, we therefore need to prevent unnecessary bankruptcies. And, and that will also help once the lockdown uh, is, is lifted because then these firms can start, start um, uh, their, their work again. And of course, once the economy has woken up from the coma, then we can think about general stimulus uh, policies, government spending on goods and services, infrastructure investment, monetary policies, to make sure that there is demand in the economy to, that allows the economy to grow. So here's a little bit of a summary of what I just said. Uh, in the immediate, we need to have uh, the health, health sector get the resources by direct budget support. The general government should, should do this. And I just note in passing here in, in the United States, if you followed the, what's going on there, there's a big tug of war between the president and the states. And uh, which has led to a kind of a a standstill because the, the states do not have enough money. Uh, after we've done that, supported the health sector, we need to worry about the workers, the firms, and again, not everyone. There's no point, well, of course, uh, of, give, of giving me money, of course, anybody, everybody likes money, but I, I have my salary. I can uh, do webinars like this. I can teach our M, uh, MBA students. And so I should certainly not receive cash transfers, but people who are not allowed to go to work and therefore uh, are in great hardship should get transfers. They should perhaps get tax cuts. They should get transfers in kind and so on and so forth. And the government should, should do that. Prof, can I just uh, step in about these cash transfers? How yes. do you think we should stop it from being stuffed into mattresses like has happened in Japan over countless uh, couple of decades. Well, you know, in, uh, if you think of these cash transfers right now as transfers enabling people to basically afford to buy food and pay their electricity bills and, and uh, rent and so on, then uh, it won't be stuffed into mattresses because oh, these yeah. are essential expenditure. People don't want to default on their credit card payments or, or uh, electricity bills. To give people more than the basic needs, that will pro probably be stuffed into mattress mattresses because there's nothing to spend on. We can't right. go out to shopping malls and, and so on. So, and, and that in some sense, that's maybe fine because when, once the economy picks up again or when firms can, can uh, start producing stuff we want to buy and when shopping malls open, then people have this money in their, in their mattresses, can go out and spend. Right. So in that sense, it's okay. I don't think we need to worry too much about that. Um, the, um, the transfers to, to firms, Again, it's, it's basically to prevent them from going bankrupt. 
they, firms have debts they have to pay off and, and uh, they have to pay rent on their, uh, on their uh, premises. And uh, we, we want to, them to maintain the possibility of, of uh, paying those, those bills. Uh, they also, you might also think of conditional to cash transfers to firms, conditional on, on them keeping their workers and paying the, their workers. That would be a, instead of paying the unemployed, we pay, we pay uh, workers to keep uh, firms to keep the uh, workers in the in the firm doing essentially doing nothing because they they, they can't go to work but they, they they're still getting paid uh, and uh, we get money to the workers that way or we can think of loans and then of course there's uh, the 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 third aspect here of, of uh, supporting firms is a mandated reduction in loan servicing obligations. That that's where commercial banks, based on instructions from the central bank, will be involved in the in the implementation of these pol policies. And that's important when we start talking about the uh, where we get the money from. And later on, there will be more general spending stimulus expansionary monetary policy, and expansionary pe uh, fiscal policy of various kinds. So those are, those are the kinds of, of uh, measures we should take. Again, they should be targeted. Health sector, targeted un uh, unemployed people, targeted on firms that might uh, need help to, to be, um, be viable once we open up. But now we have to worry, as the question suggested, how are we going to pay for this? Because as we're going to see, uh, this is costly in many countries. We can, we can do it in various ways. We can issue debt, government can borrow from the public, uh, local public international loans, if, if uh, those are available. We can raise taxes. Of course, that would be kind of silly in the present uh, circumstances to raise taxes on people when we are worried about people not having enough money. We can also print money, which is essentially borrowing from the central bank. And that was a question uh, related to um, the modern monetary theory, which says, we can issue debt, the government can issue debt, but the, the central bank should, should buy up that debt. That was my initial, initial, initial slide on consolidating the government and the central bank. Um, and uh, this notion has become, as I think was suggested by the, question, uh, the person who asked the question, kind of a fringe theory to something which is, uh, I wouldn't say mainstream, but at least talked about a fair amount. And I mean, it's more than mainstream because I mean, the chief economist of the IMF herself said that you know we should spend even after the lockdowns end. <laughs> to, to prevent. Well, uh, that's uh, maybe that's uh, in order to justify their forecast of high, such high, <laughs> high uh, growth forecast. No, uh, jokes aside, but you know that that may be may be necessary because there will be an increase in public debt. Right. And uh, if we don't, if we don't uh, monetize that by having the central bank step in and buy up uh, some of this debt, uh, you know, some countries may, uh, some countries don't default, but they may, uh, we may have a sovereign debt crisis in various countries. So and, we do uh, have. We do have a question in terms of investment. I mean, uh, I, I think it's it's poignant here because if you're looking at debasement of the currency, is gold the best alternative at this stage? Well, you know, something to just mull over, basically. Yeah, that of course has the notion of having some outside money that uh, is um, is uh, hoped to be more stable. Right. Uh, I haven't followed, to be quite honest, I haven't followed the uh, gold price recently. Uh, what has happened? Has it gone up, down? Oh, yes, it has, yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not super, superly high up, but, you know, uh, I think this is a trade that uh, has gone up and down over the last 10 years, basically, even after the crisis. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the problem with the with, uh, commodity standard like that is that... Uh, 
prices of assets like gold or, or whatever other like Bitcoin you can think of as a, an outside money, right? Yeah. Is that they tend to be very variable. And of course, that means that the price of goods in terms of the money is going to be similarly variable. Uh, because th that's just the flip side of the price of, of the gold in terms of, of uh, uh, goods. So uh, I think we need to be wary of uh, notions that um, we could have a monetary standard based on, on these types of assets. Now, it's a different question, of course, what should one invest in? And there I am uh, not going to venture any uh, recommendations <laughs> because that's beyond my my uh, beyond my remit first of all and uh, beyond what i want to try to get into uh, at the risk of being uh, and being wrong anyway so but uh, quite true if you print money uh, and you do get inflation you could also uh, but as as you mentioned we haven't seen that much inflation when people talked about the qe and the uh, quantitative easing during the the great financial recession uh, yeah. Then uh, lots of people said, oh, this is going to lead to hyperinflation, very high inflation. It didn't happen. So maybe there is something about the inflation process which is uh, not as closely linked to the quantity of money as it used to be maybe some uh, many years ago when Mint Milton Friedman and others talked about the link between pr inflation and mo money, that, that infl inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Maybe there's something else going on. And that's why we haven't seen inflation. But in countries like, uh, you know, in, in emerging markets, highly open economies, I suspect if we have a lot of monetization of debt, we, may get, we will get currency depreciations. Currency depreciation or debasement as, as, as some uh, was referred to, um, uh, has two effects. One is, is uh, it might lead to some imported inflation. So we get inflation that way, even, even if it's not through some other means. Uh, but it also, if there are um, currency mis misman mismatches in portfolios, if uh, corporates have borrowed in, in uh, international currencies and then the local currency depreciates, there's going to be a huge uh, pressure on these corporates. That's what happened. Uh, during the Asian crisis in Thailand and other countries where there were lots of foreign uh, borrowing and the Thai bot, um, uh, Thai bot uh, depreciated and uh, led to a banking crisis and a financial crisis. So uh, one should be very aware, wary of, of these um, monetization uh, arguments because um, examples from Latin America in particular where that has been kind of the standard uh, of uh, responses to fiscal deficits, monetization, suggests that it will create inflation or uh, currency and banking problems down the line. So I wouldn't want to uh, suggest that on uh, as a general response. However, uh, now, uh, desperate times calls for def desperate measures, and maybe this is what what has to happen. But in that case, some sort of coordinated monetary expansion internationally to prevent these currency war type of uh, situations from breaking out might be necessary. But of course, the international coordination of these uh, things are is very difficult. Right. Now, let me just say one more thing about, uh, about this, uh, how, how to pay. Suppose uh, banks are urged on by the treasury or the central bank to forgive some loans or uh, you know, make loan, uh, loan repayments easier. That could possibly lead to non-performing loans on the books of the banks. And then uh, who pays for that? Well, presumably the bank shareholders uh, or uh, if there's a, there might have to be a bailout of banks who have been instructed to lend. The government might, uh, the bank might say, well, you told us to lend, now we're in trouble, you have to bail us out. Uh, but that's another aspect of this um, who pays argument, I think that is uh, important that we need to think about. 
All right, let me, let me move on. Uh, unless there are questions, I want to talk about what has been, what kind of policies have authorities used in, um, in um, uh, combating and stimulating their economies in various countries? Professor, keep, keep going because we've, we've done some of the questions right. along the way anyway. All right, so let me move on to that. So what, what I show in this picture is a, from the IMF uh, fiscal monitor, there's a publication twice a year in April and October typically uh, on the fiscal outlook for uh, the world economy in every single country. And of course, you might expect that the April edition that just came out contains a lot of information about fiscal measures in response to the COVID-19 problem. And uh, you see on the left-hand side, the, the, the share or proportion of countries which have used various types of measures. And what you see there is that targeted liquidity support to firms and households and wage subsidies are the most common common uh, forms of support. These are the ones I talked about, about earlier on the, on the spending side. On the revenue measures, what is most important is a tax deferrals for firms and tax deferrals for households. You don't have to pay your taxes in the first part of the year, you can pay them later on. So that's, uh, that's the, um, on the, what the, the IMF calls above the line, that actual expenditures and revenues measures. Uh, and you see in this graph on the left-hand side, these, these are big. These support measures are big uh, in uh, the aggregate. This is for the G20 countries as a share of GDP. The support so far in 2020 is 3.5% of GDP. That's very big compared to 2009, it was 2.1%. And of course, we've just started it. This support measure will, will continue. But equally interesting is on the right-hand side, where you show these uh, below the line, revenue and tax measures are in the orange bars here. Um, but the, the, the gray bars are what the IMF calls below the line, actual, not, not actual expenditures, but guarantees. So there are potential expenditures in the future should these guarantees be, need, be used. And you see for Germany, Italy, the UK, these are very large proportion of, of the total support. And it could be quite huge fiscal burden on the government should these uh, guarantees be actually used by those who receive, receive them. So th these are uh, these are very big measures. It's going to lead to presumably large increases in government debt throughout the world economy. And the question that was raised earlier on about who pays is is going to be an in important uh, question going forward. What about Malaysia? Um, so as you, uh, I'm sure you know uh, better than I am. My, I do. Uh, there have been three stimulus packages in February, March, and, and the lat latest one in, um, in April. If you're interested in reading about these, let me uh, suggest two, two um, uh, papers you can find on the internet. One is by my colleagues uh, at ASP, Sam Flanders, Melati, and Hu Yin, um, who did a survey of uh, households in uh, Malaysia to see to what extent uh, the stimulus package uh, helped them tide over the, the difficult times ahead. The other one is from REFSA, which is uh, Research for Social Advancement Think Tank, which com and they compared in the paper the, um, the um, responses in Singapore, uh, UK, and Malaysia. And they, both these papers contain very interesting uh, data on what has actually happened. So here is from, from the REFSA paper, um, the stimulus packages number one and two. And in the red square, or rectangle rather, you see that the, the majority in terms of ringgit amounts, this amounts to about 200 billion, is in terms of loan moratoriums, loan guarantees, this EPF withdrawal uh, possibility, and some loan support to SMEs. The remainder, that's about 
40, 40 billion, so roughly a quarter of the total. It's in terms of cash pay, uh, payouts, tax deferments, um, some uh, company supports, uh, and so on, in terms of rent payments and so on. So uh, a majority is, is, is non-cash payments. And we see the details here, uh, again, from the same publication. <clears throat> Three quarters of the support in Malaysia is in terms of non-cash uh, support. A quarter is cash handouts, similar to the UK. In Singapore, they have a different, different approach. And uh, I'm not going to comment on which one is better. Every economy has its own particular particularities. So the authorities have to make a judgment call what kind of support is, is most needed. OK. Question and comments on the, on the um, actual measures in the world as a whole, in uh, Malaysia, uh, Prof, um, I think they have a, a couple of questions on where we sit uh, in what we've done uh, in, in terms of transfers compared to, say, the US, uh, Europe, so on and so forth. But bringing it back specifically to Malaysia, there has been a lot of concern by the questions on how we might fare, uh, given that I, I guess 38% of our exports are electronics uh, and electrical products. 20% uh, is ONG and palm oil, 7% or thereabouts is uh, uh, tourism. Um, you know, how do you see, uh, or have you done any research on how you think Malaysia might weather this or not, basically? Because, I mean, we have to remember the last time we properly saw any crisis was 97. GFC did not particularly hit the East, and we had a functioning China at the time as well. Right. Uh, so for economies like Malaysia's, which is very, very heavily dependent on exports, be it tourism, be it uh, you know, intermediate inputs into the car industry or other industries, which are then uh, sent off to be assembled elsewhere, or uh, be it uh, you know, the, the oil palm oil sector, which is also an intermediate good to some extent, Clearly, Malaysia will have the, the, the outlook for Malaysia is going to depend very much on the outlook for China, for the world as a whole, uh, the, the advanced countries in Europe, US. If there is a recovery in economic terms in uh, these export, main export markets, I think Malaysia can recover reasonably well, provided, again, of course, that the lockdown can be lifted. And that depends on what the evolution of the infections, the evolution of the pandemic here in this country. So, um, you know, it's obvious that the, the price, the reduction in the price of oil, uh, generally, which I, I presume will then hit the palm, palm oil industry as well, uh, is, is a big factor for Malaysia. Uh, tourism is not likely to pick up anytime soon because uh, airports are closed. Uh, you know, people aren't going to want to travel because people are scared. And uh, so I don't, the 9% the, the, the growth projected by the IMF sounds to me extremely optimistic. And it must be sort of conditioned on uh, the premise must be that the world is returning to more or less what it was like before the, uh, the, the, the pandemic hit. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I think we're seeing in various countries where they started opening up, inf infections are coming back. So I think the opening up is going to be very slow. Hopefully, it will be measured, and you know, certain sectors can open up in, in, in uh, slowly, so we can get back to some growth in the economy. Otherwise, otherwise, um, you know, the recession will just linger on and on and on. Uh, but I do think uh, that the optimism for a uh, you know 
quick return to growth is is uh, is not justified. And uh, by you know the 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 poll that we just saw, most people think it's going to be negative for next year as well. Hmm. So uh, it suggests that. Um, you know, I'm not alone in, in worrying about uh, a longer sh recession. And uh, th for that, there isn't a whole lot, unfortunately, that, that the government here, central bank or the treasury, can do. Because for export-oriented economies, uh, you know, it's the export demand that has to be there in order for us to, uh, us to grow properly. Of course, there is some in internal demand as well, which is, uh, needs to be supported, but that's a smaller part of the economy. So, but, uh, I, but, I, but I mean, at least in Malaysia, Bank Negara has room to cut rates, which most of the West does not. Correct. That is true. Uh, and uh, of course, they did uh, use that room a little bit uh, already in the beginning of the year um, with, with the rate cuts. Now, again, uh, how much will the economy react to rate cuts? Is there going to be more investment because uh, financing is more readily available at, at a lower cost? I think it, that depends a lot on the prospects for, for growth. I mean, if, if uh, export firms uh, are, are pessimistic about sales in foreign markets, they're not going to necessarily invest. Um, if um, consumers are worried about uh, retirement uh, savings and, and so on, they aren't necessarily going to go out and spend even, even if uh, borrowing costs are lower. Of course, the, the, the flip side of that is that <clears throat> deposit interest rates on, on bank deposits are going down as well with together with, uh, with the policy rate. So they, they earn less on their deposits. So yes, there's more room for monetary policy and uh, th that might help somewhat. I would be more, um, I would be happier or more optimistic if I thought there was also a lot more room, <coughs> excuse me, a lot more room on the fiscal side a fiscal space, so to speak. But I, uh, I sense that th that fiscal space isn't really there in, in Malaysia as, as much as one would hope. Uh, the, the debt is, uh, you know, it's not ex excessively large, but it's not uh, uh, something that one can be too uh, complacent about. Because if there was fiscal space, then you could imagine thinking about infrastructure investment and generating demand and employment uh, for that uh, through that uh, means. And that would then help uh, the economy uh, grow even if uh, foreign demand is a little bit on the, on the slow side to pick up. Right. All right. Yeah. Uh, any other burning questions? Otherwise, I'd like to talk a little bit about this uh, lockdown versus no no lockdown. As we as we know very well, all of us we are sitting at home, we're not uh, wandering around. Um, and uh, the the question is, if there is there a trade off between uh, sort of lockdown or less strict lockdown, as as the case in some countries? And uh, this subsidiary question to that is when should it be lifted, of course. So here, I want to take you to a, a place far up in Northern Europe, up, to, uh, up here in the map, Sweden and Norway. You may not know that I'm Swedish, so I have a little bit of interest in this country here. And Norway is right next. We're far, both countries are far away from the epicenter of the, of the, um, uh, virus uh, explosion down here in Italy, France, Spain, etc. So you would expect there to be less problems in these countries, and which is a bit there has been. But the, the two countries have used very different methods to deal with it. Norway introduced a quite strict lockdown on May 12, uh, March 12, I'm sorry. Sweden has taken a more relaxed approach, not relaxed in the sense of not caring, 
but uh, say schools remain open, uh, people go to, can go to restaurants, but there should be some social distancing, um, uh, gatherings of large, uh, in large events have been halted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are restrictions, but not as, as strong as in Norway. So what are the differences between these two countries? And it's partly, uh, my, my argument here is partly stimulated by the article by Martin Wolf in the FT on April 7. So here is, is one, uh, one consequence or consequence of something that has happened after the lockdown in the two economies. Start here. In the beginning, for about two weeks, the curves of new confirmed cases, these are moving averages, look about the same. And then all of a sudden, Norway bends down. Now very relatively few confirmed cases uh, on a daily, daily basis, new cases. In Sweden, it's going up. And still going up, if you continue, it goes up in this direction. More troubling, in some sense, is the next one. Here you have deaths per million inhabitants. You need to, you need to um, adjust for, for the population, because uh, Sweden is about twice as populous as Norway. So here's per million inhabitants. And again, in the beginning, there weren't many deaths, as you might expect. And then it's grown rel relatively slowly. Of course, it goes up because these are cumulative. So in Norway, there are now 35-ish, uh, uh, 30, 35 per million inhabitants. Sweden has gone way up, <clears throat> 140. It's now, and this was April 17, so it's a bit more. It's up to close to 200. Now, so, so here, th this looks like a cost to not locking down. I'm not, you know, there are many other factors involved, so one shouldn't uh, put too much uh, sort of causality into this picture, but it's it's an interesting thing to contemplate. So, what are the what are the costs of locking down? So, this is from the from the FT article by Martin Wolf. You see, unemployment has been uh, moving up in both countries uh, throughout this period. Sweden has gone uh, from the lockdown in March 12 from about three years to five. Norway has gone from two to 14. So here we're, it looks like we're trading off better health outcomes in Norway for a worse economy in Norway or a better economy in Sweden in terms of unemployment. What do we do? Is that something we should, uh, we should worry about? Uh, how do we decide? Prof, just to, I just thought I just wanted to butt in on, on Norway for a second. Maybe their calculus was quite literally. They were an oil producer who squirreled money away, which many, many oil co countries have not. Uh, it's, you know, it's possible that they have, you know, I don't know the details. I haven't dug into the details. It's very possible that Norway has is able to deal with this increase in unemployment because they ha have this oil fund and they can give cash uh, uh, transfers to those who become unemployed and so on, whereas Sweden does not. So, you know, there are, there are ways, uh, maybe the calculus is therefore different in Sweden versus Norway. And obviously this is something one has to, to keep in mind, the same as in, in, uh, here in, in Malaysia. We have been in a lockdown, I, uh, and uh, if you look at the numbers, they look very similar to, in terms of infections to Norway. I do not know, I haven't seen high uh, frequency numbers of unemployment in, in uh, Malaysia, so, but I pre presume unemployment is quite high because people can't go to work. Um, and uh, coming back to the issue of, of uh, sort of the small and medium term, uh, medium sized enterprises and the uh, enterprises that produce inputs to, to other factories. Uh, when, when you think about partially unlocking uh, the economy here, maybe one should think in terms of what are the essential businesses in terms of these um, value chains or production chains. So uh, we must make sure that we don't 
unlock something at the end of the chain if we have something in the, in the earlier stages of the chain, uh, which is essential for the final producer, then it doesn't serve any purpose. So we must think very strategically about how we, how we unlock these, uh, the economy. And that is, of course, extremely difficult. You need to have a very, very detailed knowledge of the functioning of the economy. Uh, and I presume our authorities are thinking very hard about that. Thank you. Well, this is actually um, the end of, of my talk, uh, unless there are questions. Um, Prof, basically, uh, most of our audience are uh, bankers, work in the uh, financial industry, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have any thoughts on where you see the Malaysian financial industry? Uh, and given the, all the government backing to, you know, um, all sorts of enterprises, so on and so forth, is there a point of looking at risk at this, you know, um, at this point? Um, is risk now totally mispriced as it was after the GSC again? Um, do you see, potentially see a bigger chance of a financial crisis, so on and so forth? And, you know, uh, given the fact that the European domiciled banks uh, and the UK ones have been told not to pay divs for at least this year, I mean, do you see a knock-on effect, uh, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, there's a million things, but right. that's, you know, um, it, it's especially to our audience, basically. I think they're, uh, they're uh, you know, thinking more or less on top of my head here um, is uh, there are a number of issues. One is how does the financing of these uh, uh, stimulus measures, how does that impact the banking sector? If there's a lot of issuing of debt, does that lead to uh, some sort of increasing in sovereign spreads for Malaysia, which could have uh, impact, uh, uh, could impact the financial sector depending on how they have structured their balance sheets. Uh, if, there are if the currency will depreciate because there may be some sort of monetary financing um, and also risk, sort of risk off in international financial markets. We've seen a lot of capital outflows from, from emerging markets in general. Maybe that will, if that continues, that could put pressure on local financial institutions. Um, again, depending on how they have placed themselves in terms of their, their balance sheet, sheet structure before the, um, the, the event. Sort of longer term, I wonder whether um, the fact that we are now uh, using virtual means of communication, uh, that also presumably means there's going to be more virtual banking um, and uh, the, the, the banks and the financial institutions, uh, and for that matter, non-financial institutions uh, in that uh, space, uh, who is going to come out ahead? One can think of, um, you know, the, the, the grabs of this world, uh, start some financial, <coughs> uh, they have already some financial aspects in their, in their uh, offerings. Will that become more and more um, sort of prevalent, therefore impinging on or taking some of the business away from, from banks as they start also lending? I think in China, uh, various sort of big, those big tech companies are moving into a lending space, taking business away from banks. I, I don't think that is happening to uh, uh, anywhere close to, uh, as, as much here in Malaysia, but it might happen because we are going to be less, um, so, or let's put it positively, we will be more used to dealing with things uh, virtually. Right. And uh, therefore we may not need to be able to go to a bank, have face-to-face -face meetings with a friendly banker and, and a loan advisor and so on. So we can, uh, and, and companies that have already set up their um, operations to do this on online virtual lending banking will prob prosper relative to others. So I think that is something to think about, and I'm sure B and banks here are doing that. Um, but that's about as far as I can sort of uh, think right now. The risks might be. 
Prof, can I ask you to uh, go down to the next page so people can take the QR code, basically, for the survey? Uh, yeah, if you'd like to use that. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, in closing here, I'd like to thank uh, AICB for, for hosting this webinar. I think it was, uh, for me, it was certainly interesting to put together the my thoughts and my slides, and, and I hope uh, all the participants uh, thought it was, uh, was uh, interesting and useful. And I believe the QR code, you explain what should be done with the QR code, please. Yes, uh, if you could just use your cameras, uh, it should uh, pop up to a screen that gives you the survey. And if, you could, if everyone could actually take the survey, I'll be, we'd be a very grateful, basically. So, uh, you know, I'd just like to bring this to a close by thanking Prof. Uh, Genberg here for his thought-provoking discussion. Um, and there's a lot to ponder upon. Um, frankly, I don't think anyone in the world knows precisely what to do, but at least I hope this has clarified some of, uh, you know, your doubts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we really want to thank all who attended and engaged with us. Uh, you've added value to this webinar. I really do uh, apologize for not being able to accommodate everyone and all the questions. Um, you know, there will always be uh, plenty more uh, food for thought uh, here. Um, do visit our website for updates on our next webinar sessions. Um, and please do complete the survey, as I mentioned again. And uh, once again, you know, thank you to Prof. Genberg, who I should mention is one of the top five economic researchers in Malaysia. And everyone, Thank you to our speaker and participants. We wish you a productive day and please do stay safe. Uh, Ramadan Kareem to everyone um, and good luck. Prof, if you have any final words? Uh, no, again, just thanks very much to the participants. Thanks to the ASCB, thanks to the ASB who has supported me. And, and again, uh, Ramadan Kareem for everyone who is in Malaysia these days. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you all.